Hello, I'm Professor Alice Roberts and this is Lockdown Anatomy. We are exploring the structure of the human body and starting with the upper limb, otherwise known as the arm. Well, I call it the upper limb because I'm an anatomist. And we've looked at the bones and the muscles and now it's time to look at the blood vessels. Once again, I'm using the fantastic 3D for Medical Complete Anatomy app. Here we go then. Here are the bones of the upper limb and you can see the vessels as well. So in red, the arteries and in blue, the veins as is traditional. This artery is the brachial artery. That is the main artery of the arm lying up next to the humerus. And it splits as we get down into the forearm into the radial artery and on the other side of the forearm, the ulnar artery, so named after the bones. So let's have a look at where the brachial artery comes from. I've added in some muscles and we can look at some landmarks. There's the lateral border of the first rib at the top of the thorax. And down there is the lower border of that muscle teres major. Now these are important landmarks that divide up that artery supplying the arm. It starts off as the subclavian artery, complete misnomer because it doesn't go under the clavicle. That then becomes the axillary artery at the lateral border of the first rib. And as the axillary artery passes the lower border of teres major, it becomes the brachial artery. It basically is the same blood vessel, but it's like those roads that change their name as you travel along them. And there's the brachial artery lying medial in the arm. As we get down to the elbow, to what we call the antecubital fossa, there it is lying medial to the tendon of biceps brachii. So the brachial artery itself crosses in front of the elbow joint and then runs down into the very upper part of the forearm. And there you can see it terminates level with the neck of the radius by dividing into the radial and the ulnar arteries. Let's put the muscles back on because it's important to think about where these arteries lie in relation to muscles and tendons. So there's brachioradialis on the radial side of your forearm. And if we strip that away, then we'll be able to see the radial artery. And you can see that it's lying between those deeper muscles, supinator, and on the other side, pronator teres. Then the radial artery continues down to the wrist, lying on the radial attachment of flexor digitorum superficialis. So it crosses anterior to the wrist, but then it decides to go into the back of the hand. And here it is running under some of the long tendons going to the thumb. So it disappears under the tendons of abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. And at this point then, it's lying in the floor of the anatomical snuff box down at the base of the thumb. Now it decides it doesn't want to be on the back of the hand at all. And so it pierces through between the origins of the first dorsal interosseous muscle to get back into the palm and at this point it changes its name to be the deep palmar arch and that supplies arteries which run up between the metacarpals but also has links with lots of other arteries around the wrist as well. Now it's time for a little bit of surface anatomy. Now I can see a faint pulsation down here at my wrist and that is my radial artery. So there's the tendon of flexor carpi radialis and if you press in just laterally or radially to that you should be able to feel the artery. And of course, this is where the pulse is most often taken. It's easy to feel the artery pulsing away there. And then we know that the radial artery passes into the anatomical snuff box. So if you press down in the floor of the anatomical snuff box, you may be able to feel its pulsation again. After that, you've lost it because it goes under the tendon of extensor pollicis longus through the first dorsal interosseus and into that deep palmar arch. Now let's have a look at the artery on the other side of the forearm, the ulnar artery. So we're going to have to strip away some more muscles in order to be able to see that because it disappears under pronator teres, underneath flexor digitorum superficialis, and then it runs down on the ulnar side of flexor digitorum profundus down to the wrist, where if you're lucky, you might be able to feel it. That's quite a weedy pulse on me, but if I press in here, just on the lateral or radial side of the tendon of flexor carpi ulnaris, I can sometimes feel it, especially if I've just been for a run, but you do have to press down quite hard. Now this artery does lie very superficial at the wrist and we've stripped a lot of anatomy away, so let's put it back. There's that flexor retinoculum, that fibrous band that holds the flexor tendons down. And you can see the ulnar artery passes over the top of it. And then it forms the superficial palmar arch, which has arteries springing from it, which go off to your fingers. These start by being joint arteries that run up between the metacarpals, common digital arteries, 
and then they split to form digital arteries which run along the sides of adjacent fingers. So that's how you get blood out to your fingertips. How does it get back again to your heart? Well, it's time to look at the veins. And there's a network of veins on the back of your hand. It's called the dorsal venous network. These veins are easy to see and it's often where cannulas are sighted in hospital. That dorsal venous network drains into two main veins, the basilic vein and the cephalic vein. You can see that cephalic vein starts over on the thumb side of your wrist, so over on the radial side, and the basilic is on the ulnar side. And they stick on those sides as they run up the forearm, so there they are again. But even at this level of resolution, you can see that there's quite a wide network of veins, and there's a chunky connecting vein as we get up to the antecubital fossa just in front of the elbow. So there are the cephalic vein and the basilic vein again, but there's also a median forearm vein running up the middle of your forearm and a connecting vein, the median cubital vein, crossing across in front of the bicipital aponeurosis, that flat sheet of tendon which comes from the biceps muscle. And if we were to strip that away, then hopefully deeper down, you can spot the brachial artery again. Now it's time for another bit of surface anatomy to try to find some of these veins on yourself. This is the area of the arm known as the antecubital fossa just in front of the elbow and that's where these veins are lying and they're easily accessible for taking blood and also sometimes for putting a cannula in too, although then you've got the problem that of course the elbow flexes so the patient has to keep their arm straight. Have a feel in there, you can feel the tendon of biceps quite easily if you flex your arm you'll be able to feel it more and you should be able to see some veins I can see these bluish veins standing out in my arm I can make them more prominent though by applying a bit of pressure over my upper arm almost like a tourniquet and also pumping your hand a bit to get the blood flowing and let's have a look again then now you can see those veins starting to really stand up at the antecubital fossa so here I am then looking down on my left elbow and forearm and you can see the two veins there, the one over on the left on the radial side, that's the cephalic vein, I can feel it, it's bulging now. And then this diagonal one on the right hand side, that is the median cubital vein which is linking across between the cephalic and the basilic and also draining the median vein of the forearm as well. Of course there's an artery around here as well so let's try and feel that. If you find the biceps tendon and push in quite hard medially to that tendon of biceps you should be able to feel the pulsation of the brachial artery. Again try and push down towards the bone and then you'll be able to feel the pulse more easily. You can feel it higher up in the arm as well if you just push in behind biceps. Let's go back to the veins and find out what happens to those. The cephalic vein continues its journey up the arm and then it runs very superficially between deltoid and pec major in the deltopectoral groove. Then it disappears and I'm going to do a strange thing here, add on connective tissue but take away muscles because this superficial vein has to pierce through the deep fascia in order to drain deep into the underlying axillary vein, the vein of the axilla or armpit where does the axillary vein come from? Well, that is a continuation of the basilic vein. So if we rotate the arm around and look at the inner or medial side, you can see that basilic vein running up the inside of your arm and then it pierces deep fascia about mid arm and a little bit higher up as it enters the axilla becomes the axillary vein. It's also going to receive deep veins too because all of the arteries are accompanied by veins. These little accompanying veins are called vini comitantes. So the vini comitantes of the brachial artery drain into that axillary vein. And the axillary vein continues up through the axilla, over the top of the first rib becoming the subclavian vein, joins up with the internal jugular, and then eventually carries that blood all the way back to the heart. So there we go, we've got the blood all the way to the fingertips and back again. Thank you for watching. I hope you found some of those pulses on yourself. Next time, we're going to look at the nerves of the upper limb, including this network that lies around the axillary artery, the brachial plexus. If you like these videos, please let me know. Please share them 
and also tell me if there's any bits of anatomy that you'd like me to explain.